you want to see that level of ignorance and hatred gone from the world. So, um, when, when I started thinking about how we might approach this, having the same feelings of um, uh, com compassion and sadness for the world, um, I came up with the most basic definition of Buddhism. The most basic definition of Buddhism is not committing any evil deeds whatsoever, practicing virtue completely, my mind is completely tamed. So that's a one sentence encapsulation of the whole um, Buddhist philosophy. So if we, if we look at that, there are several parts to that. Um, the first part being not committing any evil deeds whatsoever. So we can talk about uh, that as a way of saying we have responsibility to really look at how hatred arises in ourselves and how bias arises in ourselves, the causes of uh, these uh, terrible um, shootings that are getting more and more frequent. And in Buddhism, we look at what is the gross level to what is the most subtle level. So at the gross level, we could say um, an extraordinary level of hatred that leads to complete madness. So we can agree on that. Um, and then we can say at a subtle level, there's bias. And that at a hidden level, there is a pervading toxin. Remember my story about India and the toxins I was taking in. And we can say, certainly our culture contributes to that. All the karmic experiences we've had also contribute to that. But even more subtle than all of those is um, even um, some of the most wonderful, wonderful beings still have the tiniest belief, of, but there is an eye. There is an eye and that eye is important and needs to be protected. So it's not at a conscious level in any way, but there's a sense of I will help you only to a degree. Uh, because then I have to start protecting once it reaches that, that degree. Um, and then even uh, more subtle is the sense of self and other um, that then leads to all of those things. So in Buddhism, we really look at how do we been, begin to even approach something so complex. Um, there are many, many practices that work with the gross level of hatred. Um, and so, yes, the loving-kindness practice that we're doing is one of the antidotes to hatred, and there are many antidotes to hatred. Um, similarly, um, with bias, the kind of practice we were working with um, can help with bias. And um, what I was most interested in to see, and this is not something that's um, uh, proven other than um, in our own experience, the idea of how do we identify hidden bias. So as I was saying, um, when I take those tests, what I see is um, that it can measure hesitation. Um, and that hesitation, I think, comes from that, um, we say like and dislike, but we don't mean a conceptual like and dislike. We mean a pre-verbal um, proclivity, more like, um, a kind of mental pull yes or mental pull no that we don't identify as yes or no or like or dislike, something really, really extremely subtle. And I think it's incredible that that's been identified by uh, the scientists as a way to see that. Um, so my sense is we can really use the loving kindness practice as we're looking at, um, in many, many variations, all of the beings that appear to our minds as we start to um, extend loving kindness and start to measure um, is it our full force, do we have uh, reserves, um, is there um, um, a hesitancy that we don't even need to name but we can somehow feel. So that's why I think that's a particularly useful practice, um, but that's not enough. Getting to the root is um, the most important thing. So someone was asking, well, what do you do with the data that you receive in the loving kindness practice? So when you see um, uh, um, a tremendous resistance, then you go, oh, tremendous resistance, and you start subtly working on that through, um, uh, you can use variations of analytic meditation, you can repeat the practice, um, you can look for all kinds of Dharma teachings that will help with the gross level of resistance. Um, and then 
you start to know more about yourself and more about how difficult it is to um, get over any of your resistance. Like, if you wanted to, um, you know, sometimes I would go around the block where I was living, you know, and I would start with the nice people and <laughs> my favorite people, you know, but I eventually <coughs> get to somebody that I wasn't sure. You know, somebody that, that I was quite judgmental about that I wasn't sure if I could get over resistance to that person. So you go, okay, where is the resistance coming from? Who is resistant? Um, what, what is the, um, uh, the trigger? Is it the, the trigger pride? Is this trigger self-importance? Is the, you know, you work on your own stuff. That's what you do with the data. Um, and as you continue working on it over and over again, eventually it releases. So when we take the Bodhisattva vow, we actually take a vow not to exclude anyone from our hearts. So um, that's why in the Drikung we say, especially the enemies who hate me, the instructors who harm me. It's a reminder of that vow that when we say benefiting all sentient beings, when we say extending loving kindness to all sentient beings, it also means our enemy. And um, what is the difference between our mind and a Buddhist mind? Um, our mind um, has these resistances, and these resistances are closings of our heart. And we want to get to the open, boundless nature that a Buddha has, the wisdom of equality, where from the perspective of the Buddha, from the perspective of the Buddha, there wouldn't be sentient beings, but there would be only generating love in an equal way to every conceivable form that appeared in the relative reality. Um, also, when we're practicing in the Nundra practice, and I found this so useful when I was doing, um, it's the Nundra refuge practice. We have um, our mother to our left, our father to our right, all sentient beings behind us, but our enemy right in front of us. And so we're doing the prostrations and we're putting our enemy closer to the Buddha than we are. So um, it's such an incredible teaching, sitting there thinking, well, you really should love me more. I mean, I'm the Buddhist here. <laughs> um, and realizing the wisdom of equality is just sending out love without thinking one is more deserving than the other. Um, it's, it's a tremendous teaching to really uh, take to heart what that actually means, what it is when there's no resistance. So we want to, as we move through life, never forget that the goal is enlightenment. The goal is a completely open heart and mind. And um, if we wanted to ask ourselves what is enlightenment, we could say um, easily it's the fulfillment of loving kindness in an ultimate way or grounded in emptiness or the fulfillment of compassion. It's a boundless, concept-free, clear, primordial wisdom, the nature of which is compassion or kindness, the nature of which is, um, is uh, vast loving kindness and compassion. So we say when we're doing the um, trainings in compassion and the trainings in bodhicitta, um, when we have one moment of actual bodhicitta, that is one moment of experiencing ourselves as a Buddha. So we can start to relate to what an enlightened mind is. So um, when we were working yesterday, we were looking at how then to go to the root, um, the root of self. Um, and um, that can be approached, as I was saying, in many different ways. Part of it is wearing away uh, the reification we have that I am separate, singular and autonom autonomous, separate from you who are also single, separate and autonomous. It's a dependent uh, situation. But the only way to approach it is to very simply start with one small piece of it. So um, in the training in the Tibetan system, we look at many different levels of working with the self, and we call those tenet systems. And each of the tenet systems has meditation practices that are uh, meant to be analytic meditation, where you really start to see, is my experience, is my belief in this solid self really my experience 
and am I seeing um, an appearing reality or am I seeing things as they truly are? How can I start to um, just put a little bit of doubt in my mind, a little bit of, um, uh, it's like we're a, a, you know, a piece of marble. Can I take one chip off the solid self? Um, and so that's why we started with our direct experience. It's a very simple thing to think, okay, this is how I see the world. Is that really how I see the world? I think this is the way this I see the world. I behave as though the world is in this way. You know, I think this clock is here. I think this clock is telling time. Are things that the way I act and generally assume to be true actually that way, or is there another way to understand them? Is there a, a bigger way to understand them? Um, even if we were to talk to scientists, they would tell us, no, from science perspective, it's not true. There are little molecules and electrons jumping in and out of space, but we still believe it's the clock out here telling real time. So it's this kind of questioning practice that we do in analytic meditation. Someone was asking, um, oh, that's a, that was a very complex uh, thing to do when we're trying to let go of our thoughts. Um, and that's true because its purpose is not to let go of your thoughts. The purpose in analytic meditation is to use your thoughts to undermine um, a, a solid belief that you have uh, that you want to question. So it's a different kind of meditation. In the same way, the compassion meditation is a different kind of meditation. What you can see right away is you can't do any of those meditations if your shamatha practice isn't strong. If your sh shamatha practice isn't strong, you can't stay on, is the flower outside? Is my mind outside or is my mind inside? Your mind keeps shifting and you, you don't actually end up with a moment of certainty. We break off these small pieces, one little chip at a time, so we can have like one little minute of, minute of certainty. And then we add another understanding with certainty and another in understanding with certainty and until it starts to crack open um, our belief system. So that's why we do these many different kinds of meditation. Um, so committing to um, Uh, ceasing to harm others means we're responsible for our ignorance, we're responsible for all of our biases, and we commit to work hard on that. Um, and then we look at what happens when we're on the receiving end of bias, what happens when we encounter pain. And from that perspective, um, as practitioners, um, one way to work with it is how to make this path into a path towards enlightenment. From this perspective, we're all Garchan Rinpoche in some sort of a prison. Um, there's um, always someone who is harming us. There's always someone who is benefiting us. Um, and we are in the prison of samsara. So it's not denying that things that are unjust are happening. It's saying, yes, they're happening, and I want to navigate this, but I don't want to forget that my goal is enlightenment. So the bigger goal is enlightenment. The bigger goal is wisdom. Um, we want to have that bigger goal in mind. And this is why I say, if I, if I were, um, <coughs> if I had stayed as angry as I was when I was in my 20s about injustice, then I would have lived a whole life of anger. And I would be a hugely angry, angry person. Um, what happens over time is, um, is you see that's not the only response. And can I work with that response? Is anger really something um, that benefits me and benefits others? Um, you might say um, it's benefit beneficial in the sense that it urges you to change, but that only takes the first minute. So staying angry is um, what you don't need to do. Um, and so um, 
it leads you into a whole series of investigations in terms of um, what does one do with with anger, or what does one do with um, the uh, the very difficult situations that we've encountered as a path to enlightenment? It's similar, um, exact, it's very similar to what we do in the loving kindness meditation when we meet somebody that we're very resistant to. We look at that from many different perspectives, and. Um, the great thing about the training is that there, there are many, many different kinds of practices to use with anger. Um, eventually, uh, as you work with the gross level of anger, your mind is less and less reactive. And when your mind is less and less reactive, then you can start to see what does the situation need? What would actually be beneficial in this situation? What might change the dynamics in this situation? If you're caught up in anger, you can't really see that. If you're caught up in rage, anger and rage can be quite blinding. And then as you go further, um, along with acting um, uh, to benefit beings, you can uh, look at who is it that's angry? Who is it that's, who is this self? that is so insulted? Um, who is this self that um, takes such great offense in this situation? Who is this self that's harmed? And that goes back to the different kinds of meditations that we've done that deconstruct that sense of self. If we stay outraged, personally outraged, then we're constructing the story that constructs the self and we're making it firmer and firmer and firmer. How could they do that to me? It's all about me. Um, heading towards softening the anger to see the situation as it is, to see that there is ignorance and confusion throughout all of the dynamics. What can we do to change the dynamics, even if it's one little piece? is um, a healthy response um, as a practitioner whose goal is enlightenment as the outcome. So an example of this, um, um, I, really, I really find uh, Thich Nhat Hanh to be an extraordinary teacher. Um, and I was quite struck um, by Sister Chen Kong's biography. and. Um, it's one of her biographies, an earlier one, and I haven't been able to find it again. And she, she talks about learning from Thich Nhat Hanh's um, teachings. So when they were first forming, when they were training with him, he took a small group of students and he said, um, you can't take sides. The Americans are bombing one day. The um, North Vietnamese are bombing another day. If you want to be my student, you can't take sides. And you can imagine how extraordinarily difficult that was in the situation, because it's your family and friends that are getting bombed. But one day it's the Americans, and one day it's the, uh, the North Vietnamese. And um, he said, um, essentially, just keep feeding the people, rebuilding the homes, rebuilding the bridges, address suffering in every form. And um, the wisdom of that um, got clearer and clearer as um, uh, as I looked at sort of the history of his students in Vietnam. Um, it was so interesting uh, because on the one hand, because they were used to take sides, they were hated. The, the North Vietnamese hated them because they wouldn't say the Americans were wrong. The South Vietnamese wanted them to say that the North Vietnamese were wrong. On the one hand, they were hated. On the other hand, when they gathered everybody in the village into a market so they could try and, um, you know, address the wounds and bandage people and feed people, um, because they hadn't taken sides, they could then go to the people who were doing the artillery right at that moment and say, brothers, you know, don't hit this market area. That's where all the innocent people are. And that's how much later um, he could um, work with veterans and um, Vietnamese to do mutual forgiveness. 
because there wasn't ever a sense other than this is ignorance clouding everyone um, and everyone's suffering and that's where the real need is to bring everyone out of their ignorant states so it's tremendously tempting to take sides um, in terms of for and against um, in all of the situations that we're in but the I'm, I'm struck continuously by how um, significant his teaching was in this area in a situation that would feel so urgent and so difficult, as urgent and difficult as our situations that we're facing today feel. Um, so again, I go back to what do Buddhists contribute to the narrative? What we can contribute to the narrative is um, looking at the root cause, looking at ways to address the root cause, looking at ways to um, significantly make change and make a difference without getting into a mindset of for and against and rage, right? Because we don't want to keep making habitual patterns of rage in ourselves over and over again. And really look at how our practices can start to help us um, reveal implicit bias in such a way that once we've mastered it, we can really start to help others through um, their own uh, misperceptions of reality and all of the potential Buddhas all around us. So um, that's why we were working in several different, we in several different ways. Um, to give you some experience of a variety of meditations that each have um, different purposes and different uses. And hopefully to um, really inspire you to look at the root and to get as many teachings and trainings as possible to, to look at why you want to learn about some of the more difficult philosophical tenet systems because they get at that root, that's why. And sometimes we don't relate as much to some of the academic trainings, to um, some of the um, um, classes and studies we have to do. It seems dry, but when you look at it from the perspective of this is the root of hatred that, that we actually need to remove in order for there to be an actual change in our ignorance and an actual change in the ignorance of our culture. Um, that's the reason. Um, then there were um, a bunch of questions about uh, boundaries um, and um, how the loving kindness and compassion training work with our uh, direct experience of um, being in situations that we're perhaps not ready uh, to work with. So um, one, of, one of my favorite stories that I contemplate a lot, I, and I contemplate these stories I'm, seriously for years and years and years and years. And some of them are so useful, they're always very fresh to me. So it's the story of Milarepa at Red Rock Cave. So Milarepa is, um, one of the great meditators, one of the great enlightened beings in the Tibetan system. And um, he was in his cave, really didn't have much in his cave, <laughs> hardly any food, not, not, uh, not much of anything. Uh, and he was in his cave um, in solitary retreat for, oh, I don't know how many years. He went into retreat um, for almost his life. And the Tibetans love him uh, because he started out as a murderer. And so they really love the stories of Milarepa because he went from the ultimate bad guy um, to an enlightened being um, who essentially sang his whole life. We, what we have from Milarepa is all of his wonderful songs. So he went out to, he also didn't have anything to eat except for nettles. <laughs> he went out to get some nettles <laughs> because he relied on donation and people didn't come up the mountain. So around him were nettles. Um, and he went out for nettles and he came back and there were all these goblins in his cave. And um, they were 
he didn't have much, but what was there he was throwing around and they were playing with all this stuff. And so, um, <laughs> so he said, okay, I can handle this. These poor ignorant beings, I'm gonna teach them the, the Dharma. So he started teaching them the Dharma and they just laughed at him. Um, and so um, essentially uh, that's um, a stage of understanding where we're teaching ourselves the Dharma, we're listening, um, we're going to teachings, um, but we don't have that lived experience, right? We don't have that conviction that we know something is true because we haven't meditated on so thoroughly that it's actually changed one veil of our ignorance, right? So it hadn't got to the point where he had the conviction of certainty, um, uh, and so they just laughed at him. Mm -hmm. So then, um, then he meditated some more, um, and when he came back, he said, "Okay, friends, you know you're welcome to share the cave with me. It's cold. It's got bugs, but you want to be here, fine." And most of the goblins disappeared. So there may be some of us that are sort of in between. You know, we have a sense of um, a conviction in some of the teachings. Our sense of me and mine may be softened to a degree, and um, uh, that's when some of the uh, hindrances disappear. But left was the major demoness. I just, <laughs> and evidently she was horrifying and terrifying. Um, and um, this is the part that gets me, um, which um, I probably will be meditating on until, uh, until I die. So the horrible demoness, um, finally, um, he's able to put his head in her mouth. So that to me is when there is the conviction of no self and no other. The worst of the worst that you can imagine, that you fear the most, that threatens yourself the most. You have the understanding of no self, no other, so you can completely uh, merge fearlessly with that. So what it teaches me is in, in the, our different stages of understandings, there are different appropriate boundaries. When we're learning um, the Dharma and um, exploring um, how we might work with um, some of our own tumultuous emotions and our levels of hatred. We need to have the boundaries that are appropriate for that stage. We know we're not ready to just open the door and invite the whole neighborhood to share our house, right? We don't have that uh, conviction that there's no, no need to preserve the mind. Um, so we can't genuinely do that. We have to stay at the teaching stage until we are actually um, uh, have a lived experience that takes away the sense of me and mine. And the instructions in, um, in Shantideya, Deva, is um, not to give away things until you can uh, give them the way that you would a cabbage. And a cabbage was the, the most plentiful, cheapest vegetable. So it's not that you're supposed to be at a stage that you're not at. You're supposed to train in, in the stage you're in until some of your ignorance and confusion is gone. And you know when it's gone because it's a lived experience and it's as though um, um, they talk about it as a veil and I like that because it's something that you couldn't see quite clearly before and now you see something clearly that you didn't understand before. Um, and then um, eventually, as we keep training and growing, um, we will have that level of fearlessness, the really lived conviction of no self. And then we will be like Garchin or Mache, where we can stop the car and open the door to the guy waiting the gun. Uh, because now there's no self to define and preserve. But at each stage, there are appropriate boundaries. And it has nothing to do with um, being in a dangerous situation or feeling like you should be able to do something that you're not able to do. 
it's um, seeing that, oh, I'm at this stage, I'm going to do as much as I can um, so that my conviction actually is changed. Do you understand that? So it's not that you become a doormat, it's not that um, you allow people to abuse you. Um, particularly um, when we're on the cushion, um, it's an interesting experience because we're not in a direct confrontation. We're testing out, can I work with a difficult person? Um, in the safety of the meditation hall, with an understanding that um, your thoughts that are arising are impermanent, ephemeral, uh, fleeting things, um, and that you can ask for help from the community. So that provides a great, a great safety net um, to just explore what it might be like. And so one of the questions was someone who was saying that um, they found themselves generating anger because um, a greatly painful um, being arose in their mind. And that's considered wonderful. Uh, because here you are in the safety of a sangha on your cushion, um, seeing something arise in you while you are listening to teachings that help you explore, okay, is this permanent? Um, will this um, soften if I shift to walking meditation? Um, does this have a hold on me that um, is something I can't cope with? Um, is, it, is it true that a thought is impermanent and fleeting? So you're having that in a situation where you can question it, even though it's intense. So when these things happen, um, you start to see, all right, there's a break in the impermanence. It's still re-arising over and over again. I can feel myself getting angry, but this is good because you can see yourself getting angry. You're not getting angry without not being aware that you're angry, right? So you're starting to observe your own process. So we want to be grateful for all of these, um, all of these, uh, arisings in our meditation. And as we go along, we get more and more understanding that's lived of, yes, it is impermanent. I may be giving rise to it over and over again. It may feel like I can't get out of this mindset, but it isn't permanent, and I can ask for help for more and more trainings and more and more practices to work with it. Okay, so that is... Um, about boundaries. What I find is the most helpful thing in my experience when painful things to arise is to really recall, uh, number one, things are impermanent, but number two, um, we all have Buddha nature. So um, if there are um, aspects of my mind that I find very difficult, um, I can keep reminding myself over and over again, yes, but I have Buddha nature. So um, there's nothing actually to be afraid of in my mind because the actual nature of my mind is that it's a Buddha. So all of these things that arise are temporary, um, and when I work with them, eventually they'll go away. So um, all of the teachings are really there to help you look at what clouds your mind from seeing your own Buddha nature. Um, there were um, a couple technical questions um, about meditation. Someone was feeling um, a tremendous pressure in their head. So when you're meditating, all kinds of things happen. Um, and um, Um, sometimes, you know, there are physical things that happen. People start shaking. Someone might feel pressure. Um, none of it is really anything to be particularly concerned about. Also, sometimes people have, you know, momentary wonderful states. Also, not something to be concerned about. Um, there's a, a sense of, okay, if there's um, a pressure that you can't control, 
look to find its impermanence. Is there a break in that? Um, really start to see, are you concentrating too hard? Do you have um, some sort of rigidity um, or um, a sense of effort? Can you relax? Um, when does the pressure arise? Um, is walking be meditation better for you right now? Um, is um, in the Tibetan system we like circumambulating stupas and sacred objects. So is circumambulating a library right now a good practice for you? So really look to see um, what might, uh, what shift might make a difference. And then we get into, um, is the mind a sense object? That was another question. So I know these um, uh, definitions of mind um, you have to get used to, the definitions of categories of mind and how we work with mind. Um, so again, that's another thing to read and study about um, and work with. So um, as I was presenting yesterday, mind itself is that which is clear and aware. That's our definition of mind. And then if we look at how is the mind aware? How is it aware of sense objects? Then that comes from your sense consciousness, I or, or sense organs, and sense faculties. So those are aspects of your mind. But your mind itself, um, or what we think of as the thinking mind, is your sixth consciousness that doesn't have direct contact with the sense objects. And then, beyond that, um, we would say is primordial wisdom. So the samsaric mind has the uh, confused awareness that's perceiving sense objects. Um, and as all the confusion is gradually worn away, what arises is what has always been there, which is a primordially, a primordially pure awareness. Um, and that has no conceptual, um, there's no self, no other, no conceptual knowing. So we would say that's a non-conceptual awareness. Um, these are, these are things that it's interesting to learn about in the tenet systems, but um, the easiest explanation um, that I've heard is from um, the really great scholar Carl Bernholtzel, who's one of the wonderful um, uh, Western teachers who are uh, great, also great Kempos. And so he said, it's like the Buddha has two TVs. He has his TV and your TV. So he can see everything that's going on um, in the arising and appearing world. At the same time, um, he, she, the Dharmakaya awareness, that is that realization of the Buddha exists beyond conceptual thought. So that gets to, um, the next part of the questions, there was a whole section on likes and dislikes and why we work with that. So if we are looking at sort of unclouding our mind from all of the conceptual thoughts that clog our mind, um, I found a great phrase. Um, some writers are just so wonderful. Um, it described it as the onslaught of conceptual, of compulsive conceptuality, the onslaught of compulsive conceptuality. We exist most of the time in an onslaught of compulsive conceptuality, right? So there are thoughts all of the time. And our goal is enlightenment, which is concept free, right? So we have to look at um, how we allow the thoughts to settle. It's not that we're trying to get rid of the thoughts, it's more that we lose interest in the thoughts. Um, and so they just disappear because we don't engage in the thoughts. <clears throat> so in some ways that's um, part of our, our uh, shamatha practice. But we have to have incentive to do that. And so how do we have some incentive to do that? Um, and we look at 
what is a lot of our onslaught of compulsive conceptuality. A lot of our <laughs> conceptuality is about likes and dislikes, for and against. So that's why I was putting um, a lot of emphasis on likes and dislikes, for and against. Not only is it this compulsive thinking that we can't get out of, but it's also the compulsive thinking that leads to action, that leads to creating karma. So um, when we're doing that, um, this is another thing we have to look at with our analytic meditation. We really think we get some happiness from objects, the, the things we like. And we can say over and over again that by liking and disliking, you're causing yourself suffering. Uh, but it just sort of says, well, except for all the things I like. <laughs> um, because <laughs> clearly they make me happy. Um, so um, a good example of this, and this is really what I like to do, because um, we need to have these teeny tiny pieces of certainty. They are really important. Is to look at morning tea. Everybody likes their breakfast beverage, whatever it is, right? And people are usually really particular about their breakfast beverage. <laughs> you know, I, I ran a nunnery for a long time, and I knew that everybody, when they woke up in the morning, wanted their tea and or coffee exactly the way they like it. So, um, so you can say to yourself, I really love my tea. I like it. I like Irish tea. I like it really strong. I like 2% milk in it. That's exactly the way I like it. So what happens when I don't get that? <laughs> I suffer. <laughs> so, I, you know, not seriously suffer, but, you know, I realize, oh my goodness, by liking something, by having a preference, it doesn't make me more of an individual. It actually increases my suffering. Because, you know, I, I notice when it's not like that. <laughs> I notice when it's, you know, the Tibetan butter tea. It's a totally different kind of tea. It's not the same. So um, you have to really look at the things you like and question it and say, all right, am, by having a strong like to this, this very simple thing, something that you can see and examine and experience, um, is it actually making you happy in the way you think it's making you happy? So someone said, all right, you know, maybe, maybe some things, but what about our partners and our spouses? Isn't that the greatest happiness in life? Um, <laughs> okay, really range of response in the room. Um, but in, in happy relationships, <laughs> no, somebody wrote the question, so somebody wrote the question. <laughs> this is called the suffering of change, because um, even in the happiest marriage, even in the most loving partnership, you might say all the minor annoyances, you know, maybe they're, they're not causing me suffering. There's a deep abiding love. At some point, that person is going to die. So at some point, there's going to be a change. You or the other person is going to die. There will be a change, and there, there will be suffering in that change. So um, the wonderful thing about a happy partnership or um, the love you might feel for, um, you know, your wonderful children or um, the precious animal friends you have is that it really teaches you something about love and um, you can start to see yourself grow as a person growing in greater and greater capacity to love the problem comes when when you start making me or mine about this child me or mine about this animal um, and don't change um, let there not be any kind of change, let there not be any even fear of change. That's when all the problems start to arise. But if it is a, um, um, a heartfelt love that's infused with wisdom, it's from the love of this child I can love all children. 
from the love of this child, any child crying is my child. Right? So that um, is using your direct experience to expand your heart <coughs> to a greater and greater capacity. And then we get to the capacity of the Buddha where every single being is my most beloved child. And um, if you've ever seen um, one of the great teachers, you can see um, that they actually um, have that capacity. You can watch them greet hundreds of thousands of people with the same presence, the same genuine joy in seeing them. Um, and um, even in the room, you might you know, have people that are irritating to you. They get the same joyous welcome. There's no distinction in the uh, pervading uh, loving kindness and compassion coming from the heart of, of these great teachers. Um, and then um, there was a question about um, uh, then when there are things that you see are um, your pref preference and um, it's beneficial to yourself and others that you make that known. That's not the same kind of like and dislike. So we live in an incredibly, um, in some ways, trusting era, as much as we think things are so difficult, that we're able to say to each other, honey, if you define gender like this, it hurts me. And it doesn't only hurt me, it hurts hundreds of thousands of people. Honey, if you define race like this, it hurts me. These small actions that you don't really notice hurt me. And if, if you really um, can open your heart to this, um, it may be my preference. And um, that's not a, um, an individual preference. It's actually an altruistic preference to bring that to the attention of your uh, friends. Um, and to ask for help in terms of making it um, a greater understanding of uh, the human condition and how not to cause harm to each other. So what we're really looking for is how to keep finding ways to act with wisdom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, if we're um, trying to bring up something um, that we found hurtful from a very angry place, um, then it's, um, it's something that we might want to ask help with because the anger is what people will respond to um, and will increase the reactivity. We want to find ways to bring it up in a loving way. Which um, brings me back to Sister Chung Kong and um, Thich Nhat Han. So um, at one point they were um, at, in a French city, um, and um, it was when the boat people were coming out of Vietnam and they were being attacked by pirates, just like today with the great migration coming from um, Africa. Um, th they were drowning. It was a terrible situation. And um, he and Sister Chung Kong had, had gotten permitting for a boat. So they were going to, they bought a boat so they couldn't get the world to rescue the people. So they decided they would rescue the people who were drowning. Um, but the city official wouldn't give them the permits. So it has the urgency, right, that we feel um, in terms of things that are happening today in our own country, in our own neighborhood. Um, and Sister Chung Kong, I may be exaggerating this because I read the book a long time ago, was at her wit's end and she was really ready to go in and pound on the table and say, give me those permits, there are people who are dying. And Thich Nhat Hanh said to her, oh honey, <laughs> you can't go into the office like that. <laughs> you have to spend a day doing walking meditation and calm your heart and mind down. And um, only go in when you can see the person in a loving way and then present uh, the 
need that you have. Um, if you go in in a very aggressive, adversive way, you will only make the problem more difficult. That person will become more angry, you will become more angry, the people won't be rescued. And she talked about how difficult it was because her sense was the urgency, but essentially what he was saying was, yes, there's the need to act, but we need to act with wisdom. So we need to go in with wisdom in our hearts. And then they went in and um, they were given the permits and they were able to get to the boat. Um, but what also is tremendously interesting to me is while he was on the boat, um, rescuing the people who were um, in terrible shape. They were starving, they had been robbed, many of the women had been raped, some of the people had been killed. So it, it has the kind of situation that we see today when there's such a horrible dynamic. Um, and he put his philosophy of not taking sides into a poem. Um, and the poem is Call Me By My True Name. So essentially, in that poem, he said, if, if we really understand love, if you want, you know, as, um, you know, seeing me as your teacher, essentially, call me by my true name, not I am good and wonderful and the robber rapist is horrible. I am the pirate, I am the girl who died, I am the person who was robbed, I am the pilot of the ship, I am the person who um, had the permitting. It went into this beautiful meditation of just like Milarepa putting his head into the mouth of the, the ogress of all of the beings uh, locked into the confused karmic samsaric situation. So it's um, tremendous that we have lived during his lifetime and have access to his direct teachings and actual memory of uh, that these teachings were born uh, from times that were tr as trying, as difficult as our own. They're not platitudes. They're not um, Milarepa teaching the Dharma from books. It's lived experience that has changed the 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 mind that ignorance has shed from the lived experience of integrating the Dharma into practice. Okay. Um, I wanted to, uh, before we go into meditation again, I wanted to um, leave you with a, a Milarepa quote. So again, we have the relative reality where we um, are perceiving dependent arising beings, we are dependently arising and we're interacting and all of this confusion is occurring. And the wonderful thing about Buddhism and the Dharma is to find ways to navigate the relative reality as we're learning about the ultimate reality. So we can keep enlightenment as a goal and keep perspective um, as to how to continually work with our minds. So this is uh, from Milarepa, and I'll repeat it um, a couple of times. All thoughts in being the Dharmakaya are free. Awareness is luminous, in its depths is bliss. Resting without contrivance is equipose. All thoughts in being the Dharmakaya are free. Awareness is luminous, in its depth is bliss. Resting without contrivance is equipose. All thoughts in being the Dharmakaya are free.
Awareness is luminous in its depths is bliss. Resting without contrivance is equipose. So I want to go back to the loving kindness meditation again, and we'll do a little more work with that. Uh, does anyone need a bathroom break or water? Okay, why don't we take a 10 minute break?